experience full stop. It's the ending of something that unless you both came to that decision, there is going to be one person who might not want this to happen. They're mentally or emotionally in a different place. They might believe the issues can be fixed or worked through. When something ends and one person isn't expecting it, they are taken out of their comfort zone, the place where everything is familiar. But when the person has been in an abusive relationship, it isn't just about getting to the same place that your partner is. In fact, that place doesn't exist. And you might have discovered that they're not even close to being poles apart. The relationship you were in didn't exist and the person you thought you were married to doesn't exist either. So in this video, I want to talk about surviving divorce and give you some ideas of what you can put in your toolbox. Hello and welcome to The Divorce Sanctuary. My name's Elizabeth Goddard. I'm author of Finding Lily and the A to Z of Emotional Abuse. I help people divorce emotionally from the abuser, getting closure, healing the trauma bonds and healing the original wound. And on this channel, I talk about divorcing emotionally from the abuser as well as physically. If you're new to the channel, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're returning, welcome back and thank you. In this video, I want to talk about getting through divorce and give you some ideas of things that you can put in your toolbox to survive it. So understanding the process is really helpful, but understanding where you are on the journey and what is expected is going to be crucial. Love shouldn't hurt, love shouldn't be conditional. Emotionally healthy people do get divorced, but they make sure the process is fair. Unhealthy people don't. For your sanity, start your healing. Divorce emotionally from them so that you can then walk away when it works for you. Create a list and get practical. Escaping the emotional abuser, the narcissist, the sociopath, the psychopath is difficult enough. You're battling with your emotions, what you believe to be true and what you're now finding out are completely different. You get trapped with the onlys and maybes. If only you'd done something, or maybe if you'd done something, maybe if you hadn't said, maybe if you had said. And then just as you start to get your life back together, you're faced with divorce. As you start to detangle from them, if you haven't divorced from them emotionally, this process can feel like you're going through everything all over again. The nightmares, the trauma, the flashbacks, everything in this divorce process will be designed to trigger you. They want you to react. You want to be in a place that you can respond. And the triggers aren't just for their amusement, but they're to put you in a place where they can take control of the process. It might have started at the end of the relationship with no closure, and you've just been left hanging. You might still be trying to get answers, and you might still be trying to understand what happened. They told you everything you did wrong, if you haven't divorced them emotionally, you might still be trying to make sense of the feeling of overwhelm, trying to balance your emotions. And there might be part of you that would be willing to accept them back on any terms. You might be left with the trauma bonds. Trauma bonding is horrific. It keeps you trapped. The emotions and cravings are very real. And they're the reason that you might be willing to accept their behavior and more just to get a hit of the hormones you now crave. And through the gaslighting and the blame shifting, you believe this is all your fault and want to agree to anything just to get the hits of dopamine and oxytocin. So dopamine is the hormone responsible for the brain's reward center. And a lot of research has been carried out on the dopamine pathway and addiction. The same regions light up when you're attracted to someone that light up when you take cocaine. And the same brain regions also light up 
when we become addicted to material goods as they do when we become emotionally dependent on our partners. So you may hear people describe the emotions that at the end of the relationship, that they're addicted and going into withdrawal. So too much dopamine in a relationship can underlie an unhealthy emotional dependence on a partner. And the other one is oxytocin. It eases stress and creates feelings of calm and closeness. In a love relationship, your brain releases oxytocin during physical contact, like cuddling or sex. It's released when someone shows that they trust you, sometimes even simply by just talking. Strong bonds are created early on in these relationships. And so when they start to devalue you, it causes great pain and confusion. And if your reaction is disproportionate to the ending of the relationship, it could be an indication that you've been trauma bonded. When the relationship ended, the bond was so strong and the withdrawal is so painful that you probably looked at ways of getting back into the relationship where you were at the beginning, where you felt secure. And now you're addicted to that feeling that it gives you. But oxytocin is actually two-faced. As well as creating bonds, researchers have discovered it actually strengthens bad memories and increases fear and anxiety. So if you experience a negative or stressful event or situation, oxytocin activates that part of your brain intensifies the memory which can then lead to stressful triggers and reliving the emotions of the original wound through other experiences. So for example let's say as a child you were lost in a large crowd and you didn't know where your parents or caregivers were you felt anxious and abandoned. This is all your original wound. Later you experience an event that creates the same feelings. This is the trigger. And then you experience the same emotions and feelings from the original event. You may not recall the event that you are dealing with or what's happening in your life with this new situation. However, you may find the way you deal with it is similar to the age that you experienced the original wound. And this is why I describe the original wound like a Veruca. You need to get it all out, otherwise it just keeps coming back. And if the trauma bond is still in place, you will see the abuser as your protector. So we develop bonds for survival in childhood, usually with our caregiver, and they are the foundation of our attachment. So when our safety is threatened in some way, we turn to them for support and protection. So trauma bonding is one of the reasons it's so hard to heal from toxic and emotionally abusive relationships. The damage caused puts you in a, a state of confusion and you would have no idea the abuse was taking place. Bonding happens in all relationships, but this type of bonding is one-sided. And this is why it's so easy for them to walk away as they didn't bond with you. So when our safety is threatened in some way, we turn to our tribe for support and protection. And these bonds can be created within hours. It's a process that makes people more important to each other. And people who've experienced a traumatic situation together always have a bond of survival. It's a very strong connection and it strengthens as we spend time with someone, we make love with them, we have children together. Trauma bonding is used by the emotional abuser or the toxic person to enable them to gain power and control over us. During the idealization stage, they position themselves as the caregiver showering us with attention. It might be gifts, it might be meals out. They manufacture a love that we might not have experienced ever before. And then they start devaluing with slight put downs. It might be triangulation or gaslighting. And we rationalize this behavior, believing they care for us and we create even more bonds. This is a reason that you feel so connected to them. And when the relationship ends, you wonder how you will survive without them. And it's trauma bonding that makes it so hard to enforce boundaries. And it's why it's so painful to stay away from them. When the relationship finished, your stress levels are so high, you experience fear and you couldn't imagine life without them. They, on the other hand, play the victim and you very likely believe this was all your fault 
the pain you feel now is very real and it runs deep into your soul. These people are the masters of manipulation. You believed what they were telling you. They reminded you constantly how amazing you were. They told you how you were meant to be together and they told you that no one had ever understood them in the way that you did. They will always play the victim and the divorce process is the perfect arena for them. And this is why self-care is crucial. Where are you in the process of healing? You can take my quiz, Trapped by the Trauma Bond. I'll put the link below in the description box. And I'll also put the link to my free workbook on self-care. And there'll also be a workbook in there as well to help you understand what you want in life out of the process and what you want moving forward. Start looking at creating routines. You unintentionally found yourself in a war zone and it isn't uncommon for people coming out of these relationships to experience flashbacks, post-traumatic stress disorder, complex post-traumatic stress disorder or adrenal fatigue. CPTSD is a psychological injury resulting from repeated trauma over months or years, whereas PTSD is trauma following one single event isn't uncommon coming out of an emotionally abusive relationship to experience CPTSD. You unwittingly entered a war zone. Very gradually over a period of time you found yourself under fire. At the end of the relationship you may have found yourself reliving the traumatic experience, having nightmares or emotional flashbacks. You might be avoiding certain situations or feel constantly on alert feeling jittery or startled really easily. Common symptoms of complex post-traumatic stress disorder are emotional flashbacks, inner or outer critic, toxic shame, self-abandonment, social anxiety, feelings of loneliness or abandonment, fragile self-esteem, attachment disorder, relationship difficulties, radical mood swings, hair-triggered fight-flight response, oversensitivity to stressful situations, suicidal ideation. If you're experiencing signs of complex post-traumatic stress disorder, creating space in your life is going to be very helpful. You might be constantly looking over your shoulder or wondering if you're being watched through social media. Go outside and ground yourself. Create a space within your home, somewhere you feel safe, where you can breathe deeply. Personally, for me, travel saved me. I didn't realise I was running away constantly, but when I was away and I was on my own, I felt something lift. I wasn't looking out at cars when I was driving or looking over my shoulder whilst I was shopping. I also created morning and evening routines. So the focus was on me and being present, but away from the pain that I was experiencing. Breathing is crucial. When you start to experience flashbacks, you might find yourself ruminating and box breathing can help you break that. You can get trapped there for days or even weeks. Your brain was tricked to ignore the body's warning that it's in danger and under threat for it to run away or to fight off the attack. It was tricked to believe the person who is, was causing the harm was actually protecting you. It was trained to go and find examples of their good behaviour. So when the cravings start, you might find evidence that they were good and not of their bad behaviour or that it's your fault and they didn't mean to hurt you. Box breathing, and I will put a link below as well, is counting and breathing. So pick your favourite number. So for instance, I use six. I breathe into the count of six and then I hold for that number then I breathe out to that number and then I hold again and just keep repeating. So I breathe in for six, I hold for six, I breathe out for six and I hold for six and breathe in and just keep repeating and repeating. It works in different ways. So it calms down the nervous system which has been triggered and it stops the flashback or the thought process because you're using a different part of your brain to do the counting task brings you back into your body 
and from here you're able to match up the act and call it what it is which is abuse grounding is also very important again that helps you stay in your body and from here and with the same as the breathing you can see the abuse it helps to reduce and eventually stops the flashbacks it helps you feel safe or start to feel safer I can go deeper and say that if you're able to work with your wounds then please take that opportunity before the divorce commences the process itself will be used to cause you more pain and conflict and given the opportunity your abuser will distract you and perhaps even try and get you down the route of divorce quicker than you are ready for if you're still hurting and trapped it's ideal for them if you are still needing them or wanting the contact from them you are in a better position to manipulate being divorced emotionally from them means that you're looking for the divorce that works for you and not for them so when you hear words like you don't need a solicitor or a legal team we can sort this out ourselves or you can trust me your gut kicks in and says uh no you can't and during the divorce process they're going to pull in their psychopathic traits they are unable to form emotional attachments and they're unable to feel empathy for others but they can be very charming and manipulate to get the trust of other people easily so during the process you will see them as you remember them in the idealization stage and it's easy for you to believe that they've grown emotionally or that they've that you've got it all wrong and question what you're doing triggering your hormones again and this is why it's so important to breathe and ground another tool for the box is to write out your story and this is for your eyes only no one will be critiquing the spelling or the grammar but when you get stuck in the cycle of again believing this is all your fault you can remind yourself of their behavior. And you can actually take this one step further by writing out a timeline and then next to it, start looking at the behavior. So when you went to the wedding of Louise and they flirted with your best friend, you were told you had trust issues from a previous relationship and you believed them. But the trust issues actually came from an affair that they'd had whilst you were dating or from you finding them on a dating website, whatever the story is. So start looking deeper. It might be a scenario where you were told you were jealous and it was actually triangulation where they were making you jealous. It might be when you protected people like your children and stopped them talking or playing, knowing that your partner was going to explode with anger. This is walking on eggshells. So by naming it and labeling it, you're able to see this wasn't your fault. You're able to see a pattern of behavior and you're able to call it out for what it is, which is abuse. By emotionally divorcing, you'll not be reacting to them or their demands. You are responding to them. You will not be playing their games. You might already be in the middle of your divorce proceedings. And that's fine because you can still use everything that I've said so far. I want you to remember that your legal team work for you. They have a duty of care towards you. You are a paying client. Even the legal team from the opposing side have a duty of care towards you. They have to make sure what is happening and being proposed is fair. This is a negotiation process. So please bear in mind that they will play games. If you're not emotionally fit or emotionally divorced from the abuser, then you can get trapped back in the trauma. A common theme seems to be that the exes are not replying or responding to paperwork, and this costs time, money, and energy. So think about asking your legal team what they do if this happens, what experience they have with the narcissistic or manipulative people. Also, I suggest putting in time frames with anything so it has to be replied by a certain time, within a certain time. Another thing that I would suggest you decide before meeting with your legal team, if you um, haven't already started that process, is that you decide what you want from the negotiation. And as I said before, I'm gonna put a link into the workbook, which is turn broken broken into your superpower below, 
plan everything. If you have children, are there dates you specifically want them for, for say family holidays or celebrations? What do you want to do for things like Mother's Day and Father's Day if they're with the other parent? By being divorced emotionally, you'll be able to ask for what you want rather than just accept what's being offered. This isn't manipulation, it's a negotiation. If you can, make sure before you start this process that you're ready to negotiate and check what you have to negotiate with. Make sure you have a list and you know what you want. These are your non-negotiable items. You're not going to move on them. And have another list of what you're willing to negotiate on. And then there's another list of the items or areas that you're willing to let them have. As part of their game, they don't care how much this costs you financially, costs you mentally, emotionally. You need to have things that you can allow them to win with. It might be a tea set that Auntie Doris gave you as a wedding present or a picture that you bought. It might be an additional hour visitation with the children. But you need to be very clear what it is that you're giving away. This, like everything else, is a game. You didn't have the rules during the relationship. Why would this be any different now? Remember, they are master manipulators. They play the victim. And when they've taken everything from you, poof, like a genie, they disappeared. Taking with them the fake future you created together. And then they left you to pick up the pieces, tidying up their mess. So when it comes to the divorce, you need to be very clear. Divorce them emotionally by breaking the trauma bonds. Put yourself first over everything. And if you start to spot their games or things don't add up, question it, question everything. Remember, you're dealing with a child dressed as an adult. They need to win. Even a tiny win is a win to them. And I want you to remember, you know more than you think you do. During the idealization stage, they play games wanting to find out as much as they could about you. Your dislikes, your hopes, your dreams. This was to create a persona that you would trust, you would love, and you would do anything for and give up anything for. During the relationship, they dropped their mask a few times. You saw glimpses of who they really were. You might have met a damaged inner child or a person who craved money and would rob a close relative to get it. You will on some level know what you have to negotiate with and you will know what is important to them. Just be aware of the games that they could play. Who's divorcing who? My observation around this is that if you're instigating the divorce, they hold back. They will sit on paperwork, they won't respond. However, they might start the proceedings if they see you broken and weak and in a position that they can manipulate you and push everything through. Surviving the divorce process, get yourself ready. In your toolkit, have some grounding and breathing techniques. Make sure you've got your story written out. Do you know everything you need to know about timescales and how the divorce process works? And have you sat down and thought about how it's going to work for you? Do you have your list of negotiables and non-negotiable items? Do you know what's really important to you? And more importantly, do you know what's important to them? And then you can look at what you're feeling about the process and you can be really honest with yourself. It might be that you have a mixture of emotions. You might have relief, anger, hate, fear, love. Acknowledge them all. You might be scared. You might be feeling overwhelmed. You might be confused. But it's really important to take the time to understand the process. What forms will need to be completed by when and what order. You might have handed this over to somebody else, like a legal team, but you still need to know how it works. Make sure they're working for you. Remember, you are a project to the emotional abuser. They know how to trigger you. Each email or letter has the potential to be loaded so that you will react. And then they sit back with their popcorn and watch the fireworks. And even if they don't see the reaction, they get supply from imagining how you're going to react. 
There are so many things that you can do to help yourself during this process. So there's grounding and breathing, which I've spoken about, creating a self-care plan. But understanding where you are emotionally is gonna help you understand why you're reacting. Understanding the legal process will help you stay in control and out of overwhelm. Understanding your trauma bond will help you heal and create a plan. Understanding what you want will help with your negotiations. And understanding who they are will also help you negotiate. So that's really crucial with writing the story and labeling the abuse that took place. Remember to trust your intuition. What is it telling you? Each letter and email has the potential for information to be hidden inside it. So what you don't comment on will be taken as an agreement. So those triggers, looking for your reaction, are also hiding or masking more important information. I hope you found this useful. If you'd like to find out more ways of working with me, I'll put the link to my website below. I'll also put the links to both my books, Finding Lily and The Age Said of Emotional Abuse in there as well, along with the workbooks that I've already mentioned and the other resources. I'll also put a link to my Facebook group, The Divorce Sanctuary. Come and join us over there, help support you while you're emotionally divorcing from the abuser. Please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. So it just helps me get more content further out and helps other people. Sending you loads and loads and loads of love.